friends and welcome back. I'm Mark Baker and in today's broadcast we're going to continue talking about the subject of the battlefield. In the previous few programs we've been talking about the soul, looking at the battleground where we fight the enemy. We've taken our text from 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and let's just jump in there first today. And then we'll go back to Hebrews chapter 5 and see where the Holy Spirit takes us from there. In Hebrews chapter 10, it says, Now, for though I, we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and brings, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Casting down imaginations in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. But it says, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. The weapons of warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What are those strongholds? Once again, those strongholds are imaginations. They are thoughts that are contrary to the word of God. So in Hebrews chapter 5, in verse 11, it says, Of whom we have many things to say, and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. One thing that occurred Early on, this is almost 30 years ago when I was at Bible school, that really confused me was the president of Bible school told the students one day that in ministry, there were a lot of things the Lord was showing him, but the Lord would not allow him to teach because the people would not receive it. I did not understand that at the time. I was thinking, well, if God's showing it to you, he's showing it to you to release it, to, to release it to the world. You got to get your revelation out to the world if God shows you something. But then over time, the Holy Spirit brought me to these verses. Dull of hearing. When for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again what be the first principles of the oracle of God. And it become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. You see, we need to be very mindful of the things the Spirit is showing us as we're spending time with Him. He has to know that He can trust us with what He's showing us. A lot of times, as you move deeper into the things of the Spirit, you want to go tell everybody everything He's showing you but you need to let him guide you and lead you. There are things that I might talk to Carol about that I may not necessarily share in these programs or share in services as we go out and start ministering. There's things that I might share with a friend that I would never share while teaching in a, you know, in, in a Bible school or a Bible, a Bible study. You need to be mindful and learn the ways of the Spirit of God. He knows where each of us are at. And there are times, and the reason he, you know, the president of the school learned that, said that, was if the people are dull of hearing, they're not going to receive. So you basically, by trying to release things to them, are wasting their time. And that's where Paul was saying, you should have grown up, you should be teaching, but even after all this time, you have need of receiving the first oracles, going back to the very basics. And unfortunately, as I talked about in the last program, we have so many distractions in our world today, so many things pulling for our attention, so many points of input. We have our phones, we have 
you know, portable devices. We have laptop computers. We have TVs. There's hundreds and hundreds of channels. Untold number of sources to get news. We have sporting events. I mean, we are in information overload. And the result of it is we've become dull of hearing and we're unable to walk into the deeper things of the Spirit. The Spirit of God desires to take us out into some deeper things. There's revelations He desires to release. But because our souls have become so clogged up and there's so many strongholds built up in our souls that we are unable to receive it. People talk about, well, I don't understand, you know, I'm believing to see the power of God flow. There are prophets that today are releasing so-called prophecies, and I don't know how better to say it, that God is going to just change the world, that God's going to pour out His Spirit. But see, the Spirit of God wants to know that He can trust us with the precious things in the precious revelations. If we have been spending all of our time filling our soul and allowing the enemy to distract us away from the things of the Spirit, we're going to be dull of hearing. He's not going to release these things to us, not because he doesn't desire for us to see them, but because we are not going to be able to receive them. It's just going to be another one of hundreds of things that we're allowing to come into our souls. Friend, one of the greatest things that we need to learn, and this I'm speaking to myself with this too, is how to be quiet. This is something he was asking me about just this morning. He was asking me, would you ever be willing just to sit down and do nothing? Seems like a very strange question. But it reminds me of a situation. I was up in Ohio, and I've shared this in previous broadcast. But we were in a service. Worship team was going. Holy Spirit just asked me, tell the people to be quiet. I got the people quiet, and we just stood there in his presence. Ten minutes passed. People were getting antsy. People were moving about, shuffling. Twenty minutes, thirty minutes, forty minutes. It was just over an hour. And all of a sudden, there was like this rush of wind just blew through that place. I didn't understand it now, but looking back, in context of what we're talking about, he could have blown through that place 10 minutes in, 20 minutes in, but it took over an hour for the people to come to that place of stillness. I think about services I've read about back in the 20, 1920s and 1930s, in early days of Pentecostalism. They would have a Sunday morning service, and the, pres- the Spirit of God would begin manifesting, and people would just stop, and they would just get quiet in His presence. And they, I've heard ministers who lived back in those days and saw it, and people who testify that it was just still. And sometimes it would go on for hours. Sometimes the morning service would go till seven or eight at night with nobody moving, just sitting quietly in his presence. The babies wouldn't cry. They wouldn't need their diapers changed. Just sitting in the glory. Today, our concept of the glory is people running, shouting, laughing, dancing, singing loud songs, playing loud music. But you will find that the glory comes in the silent places. When the glory truly begins to manifest, and I'm not against the running, the dancing, the shouting, 
Because those, a lot of times, are ways he trains us to go deeper. But the problem is we're not going deeper. We're trying to stay in the shallow end. And the battlefield is in our soul. But because we're just making the Holy Spirit just one more of an innumerable number of inputs into our soul, we're not receiving the deeper things that he has for us, friend. His, it just hurts him so badly. I once heard Dr. Kenneth e. Hagen talk about that we do not see the miraculous today the way they saw it in the early 1900s because we do not reverence the Spirit the way they did back then. You see, back then, it was not abnormal to have a service where people would just sit quietly for hours on end. Today, if you have a period of silence that lasts more than a minute or two, it becomes an awkward situation because we are so programmed to always have something happening. Back then, they might have a keyboard like a piano or even some of the bigger churches might have an organ, but they didn't have the bands we have today. Today we have fog machines, we have, you know, guitars, drums. It's very upbeat music, feeding our soul, feeding our physical being. But Jesus said those that worship him when he was in John chapter 4 must worship him in spirit and in truth. Truth comes back to the word of God. Truth is what we wash our souls with. The battlefield we're talking about is not the battlefield, you know, of this world. It's not where we're, you know, you have two enemies fighting to determine who the victor is. We are sealed into Christ, friend. Jesus has obtained the victory. The battlefield is not a war in the sense of what we would think of a war today with people shooting at each other. The battlefield is bringing every thought captive in obedience to Christ, in obedience to the, no to the knowledge of him. Because when we can come to that place of stillness, where we are able to bring our soul into, you know, a place where it's completely still, and you can do this. It might take you an hour, two hours when you first start, but you can train yourself to come to that place of stillness very quickly. And it's in that stillness that you will find your belief rising and your belief reaching down into your spirit and pulling up the faith of God that's already within you. And when that faith of God begins to be pulled out, the power will begin to manifest. But the reason we're not seeing the manifestations of the power we're praying for is because we become too busy, too distracted, we want to have something happening. We need the input of this world. We need, you know, we, this idea of sitting still is so foreign to us. We become dull of hearing. In the stillness, we find him waiting. In the stillness, we achieve the flow. In the stillness, we will know his power, his presence will be free to go. The world will see they will come for those who learn to walk in the stillness. For it is within that stillness 
we find his embrace. It is in his embrace the anointing is imparted. For it is in his embrace he begins to empower us. The world will begin to sense the presence of those who will step back and find this place of stillness. But the battlefield that keeps you from getting to that place that God is calling to you to is your soul. I believe this is why Jesus said in Mark chapter 4, talking about the parable of the sower, if you do not understand this, you will not understand any other parable or any other teaching. Because the word of God must be planted and sown into our souls and allowed to grow. That's where he gave me in the past year, and I've you know shared it in the previous broadcast, I've shared it before. You will never reach a higher level of intimacy with the Holy Spirit than of the level of intimacy you have with the Word of God. Turn over to First Peter, or Second Peter, I apologize. These are, if you've been watching these programs, verses that will probably be familiar with you because I talk about them a lot, but it bears repeating. We have the faith of the Son of God in our spirits. Belief operates within the soul. Unbelief operates within the soul. The more time you spend with this world, through television, through newscasts, through all these things, the less anchored you will be in your faith, in your unbelief, in your belief. And the less anchored you are in your belief, the less anchored you'll be in your faith. Because God imparted his measure of faith, the measure of faith, into your spirit when you made Jesus Lord of your life. And if you've not made Jesus Lord of your life, friend, it's a matter of believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth that he is your Lord. In Ephesians 1, you can see he's already made you acceptable. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what kind of life you lived before. His blood makes you acceptable before the Father. And so it's just a matter in Romans chapter 10, verse 10, it says that we believe in our heart, we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. If you've done that for the first time, send us an email to prayer at nbmediaministries.net. We want to pray for you. We want to come alongside you. But here in 2 Peter chapter 1, we'll start in verse 1. It says, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God, and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby given unto us great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Focusing in on verse 4. Whereby these, what what is he talking about? The great and precious promises. Where do we find his great and precious promises? We find them in the word. In his word, friend, is where we find those great and precious promises. That is why it is so important for us to be willing to turn things off, to shut down, to turn away from the input of this world, to allow him to feed his word into our souls to wash them with the water of the word as as Paul talks about in Ephesians and as James talks about the saving of the soul with the word. The word of God is what needs to be built up. You have strongholds in your soul of thoughts that are contrary to the word of God. There are strongholds of sickness. There are strongholds of poverty. There are strongholds of unbelief. 
In those strongholds of unbelief are a result of a lack of time in the Word and a lack of relationship with the Holy Spirit. And they connect you to the spirit of fear. You can take the Word of God and begin to tear those things down and rebuild the towers of old. Rebuild those towers within your soul with the bricks of God's Word. Brick by brick, you build them up until they become a fortress that's impenetrable, that those thoughts of the world cannot break through. And it is in that for fortress you'll find shelter and you'll find his presence. But brick by brick, we built, we built this tower verse by verse. Each verse, each word from the Spirit becoming another brick in that wall, in that tower to build the new strongholds. You can shatter those thoughts those strongholds. You can take everything the enemy has built up in your soul and bring it captive to the Word of God. And as you do that, you'll become a partaker of his divine nature. You see, in verse 3, it says, His divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him. He has given you everything pertaining to life and godliness that you will ever need in your spirit, but you have to draw it out. It is the knowledge of him built into your soul that will start to generate the belief that serves as the generator that connects into the faith of the Son of God that's already in your spirit, into this provision that's in your spirit. And that generator then will begin to draw that stuff out, just like an elevator in a mine, you know, will draw the materials out as they're lifted up to the surface. Your soul is that generator. And at first, it may only be a small nugget here or there that's pulled out. But as you continue in the Word, as you continue feeding the Word in, you'll find this becoming more and more that is being pulled out of your spirit. Deeper and deeper wells of revelation will be tapped into. We become partakers and we escape the corruption that is in the world. Now, this word escape is an interesting word because if you look at it, it underlines previous undesirable connections. So as we fill our soul with the word of God, the word of God will begin to break undesirable connections to the world system, to the spirit of fear. It'll enable us to escape those connections, but our soul is created to be connected. That is why the Word of God operates as a seed. As you continue to feed it in, it will break those connections, just like you're cutting roots off of a tree. And it will begin to deep, grow deep roots that will form connections to the power, the provision that is in our spirit. Those roots will drill down deep into your spirit where the life of God is, where the divine connect and start creating divine connections. Those ungodly connections to the world system will be broken, will be cut off. And you will start seeing these roots growing from your soul and your spirit. And as they make these connections, they will create channels through which the water of life, the living water that Jesus spoke of when he was speaking to the woman at the well in John chapter 4, to begin to flow outward. At that point, when those connections are made, it will move from the well of living water that Jesus spoke of in John chapter 4 to the rivers that he spoke of in John chapter 7. Rivers of living water will begin to gush forth because they will now have channels through which to flow. When you make Jesus the Lord of your life, you become a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away. All things become new. 
but you must get into your soul and begin to cut it with the word of God. It's sort of like somebody in the jungle having to, you know, cut a path. You have things that are deeply rooted into the world system, into the spirit of fear in your soul. And that's what Peter is telling us. By these, you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. By these, you break the connections to the ungodliness, and by these, you create new connections. By these, you break connections to ungodliness, and you create new connection to his life that is already within your spirit. These are not things we're waiting for him to impart. They're already there. But we have to dig into the word, and we have to allow it to renew our minds. To tr That's what the transformation Paul talks about in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 is. And then the word partakers, what does that mean? A partaker is a participant who mutually belongs and shares in fellowship. It is a person who walks in relational aspect of fellowship, experiencing the fullness of all that is owned by the one with whom they are in fellowship, and in turn, giving all that they have back. By these, you enter into fellowship. By these, the promises of the word, into fellowship and partake of all that God is, friend. Well, our time is up. And as we close out our broadcast today, I want to remind you once again, Carolyn, I love you. We're praying for you. And please, Send us an email. Let us know what God is doing in your life. Let us know how we can join you in prayer. It's prayer at mbmediaministries.net. And until our next program, remember that you can live life to the fullest, walking in deep connection, releasing the faith of the Son of God into your world.